that's when You betcha. Yeah, he knows how to get here. Yeah, you can you can go slow on your your stuff. Hey, good morning, and uh, welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Solano Emergency Medical Services Cooperative. Did I do something wrong? Bing, bing. That was my time. My time is up. Thank you very much. All right. So we'll call the meeting to order. And before we go to roll call, uh, just a quick reminder in case of emergency, your exits are right here and your closest AED is, is right behind you from there. So with that, can we uh, have a roll call, please? Yes. Bill Emlin. John Jansen. Yes. Here. Joshua Shadwick. Here. Cesar Javaharian. Christina Miller. Here. Thea Gibney. Here. David Apicionati. Here. We have one absent. We have a quorum. Okay. Um, I'd also like to take this time to welcome our new member, Christina Miller, the uh, city uh, manager of Ria Vista. And Christina, if you want to introduce yourself, that would be great. And welcome. 
Thank you. Um, I've been with Rio Vista for about eight months now, so I don't know if I can still call myself new. <laughs> um, it still feels a little bit new. We did have to relocate from um, the Corning Chico area where I was the city manager for over seven years. And so um, I'm very happy to be here. I've been um, brought up to speed as much as possible, and I look forward to learning more. All right, again, and welcome. Um, with that, items from the from the floor or from the public. These are uh, anyone that wish to address the board on items that are not on the agenda. Seeing none, perfect. We'll move on to item four, approval of the minutes um, on the January 11th, 2024 minutes. Um, the only thing I noted on there was a uh, error on 8A on the minutes where we uh, elected uh, Christina Miller the vice chair. <laughs> so if we can make an amendment to that, I would greatly appreciate that. Unless you want mm -hmm. to sit up here. I'm happy to okay. wait a little bit All of right. time Fine. till be, I get adjusted, be, be but thank you. We highlighted it for everybody in your binders. You can see that, and then uh, Karen will take care of that. Okay, so can I get a motion uh, approval of the minutes with the amendment? Motion to approve with amendment. It's been moved, second. Need a second? There we go. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Okay. Perfect. And then item five, approval of the agenda. Uh, ben, any changes to the agenda as presented? No, not at this time. Okay. With that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. And second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Perfect. Move on to item number six, information re reports, and we'll start with the medical director's report. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Pranav Shetty. I'm the medical director for Solano County EMS. Um, this will be um, relatively um, brief. Um, uh, starting on March 1st, we had three new protocols go into effect. We've discussed these before as they were going through their revision and comment period. It was C3 under pulseless arrest, which um, replaced a number of outdated uh, BLS and ALS uh, protocols that we had in place. Um, M10, which is a new sepsis protocol, this was put in place to um, optimally identify uh, patients in the pre-hospital setting that had signs and symptoms of sepsis so that the hospital could um, intervene on a more rapid basis with fluids and antibiotics and other life-saving measures, um, as well as S13, which is a special procedures protocol, which um, allowed um, uh, medics or pre-hospital providers to start patients on an epinephrine drip for hypotension not um, uh, responsive to IV fluids. Um, on April 1st, we, um, in collaboration with uh, Medic, um, initiated the local optional scope of practice that we had applied for to allow ALS providers to do um, certain medication drips for interfacility transport, including nitroglycerin, magnesium, amiodarone, heparin, and blood products. Um, we're still working along with um, Medic on uh, training all of the providers in um, uh, in basically uh, ventilating patients, um, allowing for automatic transport ventilators for interfacility transport, and so we'll update the board um, when that goes into effect. Um, we're next gonna be working on our respiratory protocols. If um, you recall, for the last several months or so, about almost a year, we've um, had a cadence of um, revising and updating um, all of our protocols, and so we've done behavioral and cardiac, and now we're um, moving to respiratory. Um, we have also initiated um, transition from our pre-hospital airway from the King Airway to the IGEL. Um, that was always approved in, in state from, for adults. We had a conversation on getting it approved in pediatrics, and we had applied for a pediatric um, local optional scope of practice, but it turns out the state realized that they never had the authority to regulate LEMSAs on use in pediatrics, so basically it's up to a LEMSA discretion whether the IGEL can be used in, in pediatric patients, and so we've um, elected to do so. And I believe Scott will talk a little bit more about this in detail regarding our rollout plan and training um, and collaboration with our pre-hospital providers. Um, we had two um, 
disciplinary um, issues, um, not necessarily in Solano. There were two, two EMTs that were initially certified in Solano, but working in Contra Costa that had a patient care issue. And so we assisted, our team assisted Contra Costa with their probations, um, which is active now. And then we are working on an, a revocation of a license um, for an EMT. This was a, a DUI case that we had discussed in, in previous meetings. And so that's um, the legal um, barriers have been lifted. So we're working on the regulatory side for their um, licensure issues. Um, and that concludes my report. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Any questions? Nope. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go ahead and move on to item uh, 6B, the administrator's report. Good morning, board. Um, the team, EMS team here at Solano County, we've been busy the last quarter. Uh, we've been participating in multiple drills. Just going to give you guys a little breakdown of those drills and uh, the collaboration that we had in the county, if not the region, and if not the, the federal also. So the first one, I'm going to pass the mic back to Pranav real quick because he's definitely uh, um, involved in the National Disaster Medical Service. Um, it's a grant through the – you want to go for it? I, I did the abbreviation. So. Yeah, yeah, no worries. NDMS. So That's correct. There you go. So um, so at UC Davis, I'm the PI for a grant that we have from a department of – the Department of Defense to work on improvement of the national disaster medical system. The NDMS is the system that we have in place to essentially respond to what has traditionally been um, civilian national disasters such as Katrina or Sandy and all of these things. And it, it basically falls under the auspices of um, ASPR, which is the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response under HHS, you know, overall. So we have a, a project that's working with uh, Travis Air Force Base and what's known as the Federal Coordinating Center there, which is one of the key nodes of NDMS, in how we would respond to a natural disaster that would actually result from a military contingency, meaning that there's an overseas conflict and um, there would be, have to be a number of um, soldiers or injured service members that would be repatriated into the U.S. And knowing the limitations of our military health system, like the VA and, and David Grant Medical Center, and the scale of what this could be, there's, it's anticipated that this could spill over into the civilian healthcare system, and then you know, soldiers would need to be taken care of in civilian hospitals. And even though this has been planned for a long time, um, it's never happened, thankfully, in the 40 plus years NDMS has been active. And because of that, all of the procedures that have been in place to allow for the mechanistically for this to occur have basically gone by the wayside and nobody knows you know how it would happen and that goes from receipt of patients identifying where patients need to go polling our facilities you know which we do now for all, all MCIs you know like how how do we work through that so um, we have a, a project that's been working on this for the last 10 months or so um, and of course, the you know Solano County Lemsa, and especially the MOAC and the MOAC function is integral to this because that's the entry point into our California Emergency Management System under under SEMS. And so, we um, have had many conversations, uh, like internally, you know, on this with our um, NDMS partner hospitals, with the Federal Coordinating Center, with other entities, you know, involved in this. And actually, recently. We had an exercise um, in which we simulated the receipt of 120 patients into to Travis Air Force Base um, and basically virtually distributed them among our kind of local healthcare, in our, into our local healthcare market. And so we certainly, um, you know, appreciate uh, the support of our partner hospitals, of, of medic ambulances, which graciously donated um, Stephen Buckner's time uh, as an ambulance supervisor to act as a transport coordinator during this exercise. Both Scott um, Agnes and Keith Erickson from our team were um, on site on base to help um, coordinate basically the, the SEMS function of this, you know, polling hospital, getting ambulance strike teams, getting our local EMS involved. And so I think we um, learned a lot about the deficiencies that we have in our system. It was, a, it was I think it was a successful exercise in that um, it didn't all go as planned, which is, if, if it all goes as planned, I think that exercise is not worthwhile. And so it didn't go, all go as planned, and we learned some, some valuable lessons from that. So um, I know that was a lot of information, uh, but happy to take any questions on that about the project, or we can um, speak about it offline. Thank you. 
Yeah, one good thing to add is our local optional scope with which we have with our paramedics being able to take drips and vents really showed um, the federal response that we are able, our paramedics at a lower level were able to help out where they would need critical care transport. So um, they're able to actually get patients out of there a lot faster without having a higher level of service. So that kind of made uh, shine definitely, you know, with the support with Medic Ambulance and of course with the LEMSA approving uh, that local optional scope. Um, the other drills that we've done is uh, we did a Region 2 and 4 MOAC, which MOAC is Medical Health Operational Area Coordinator. Just want to, we start using all these uh, abbreviations. So um, we did a strike team request and also a supply um, request. We did that over the weekend uh, with success, so that was another practice. And our last drill was with uh, Bay Area Training Institute. Uh, we did it at tabletop with all stakeholders of uh, local law enforcement, fire, and hospitals um, here at Solano County at, at the OES, Office of Emergency Services. So the team has been pretty busy in the last couple of months, unless we just did a really bad job planning and they just all came out, you know, in the beginning of the year. Um, also, I'd like to add that EMS Week is coming up. Um, this will be celebrating 50 years in EMS, so it's a big number for us here. Um, we are going to be down at the Board of Supervisors here at the Solano County doing a resolution on April 23rd. We are hoping that we get a lot of our stakeholders, our partners, and our first responders to come down um, while we um, get recognized by the Board of Supervisors. Um, also, okay, now right to the system performances, uh, which we're looking at is going to be October 1st, 2023 to December 31st, 2023. Uh, our ambulance provider, Medic Ambulance, will be at an overall 98.6%. Following the PPP providers, um, Benicia will be at 95.2, Dixon Fire, 95.7, Fairfield Fire, 92.8, Vallejo, 94.1, and Sassoon City at 95.6. And that will conclude the administrator report. Excellent, thank you. Um, Medic Ambulance Operators Report. Welcome, Jimmy. Uh, good morning, board members. Uh, nothing crazy to report. I think Dr. Shetty took my thunder, so I really appreciate it. No, I'm joking. Uh, no, there's a lot of good coordination. I think the, the drill is a big deal for us. Uh, Steve Buckner is one of our uh, administrative managers and a big part of our disaster teams and uh, I know he gives a lend a lens a big hand during those events and unfortunately but fortunately we've been tested uh, in our disaster response and we're kind of like ground zero for all the fires and, and everything else in, in the region so uh, but with our AMBU bus uh, with our mobile disaster trailer that the state has the DIMSU uh, mobile command vehicles and uh, our special ops we're prepared, like we're ready for something like that. We're lucky to have that resource. And we also have now a bus resource in Sonoma as well. So uh, if something big happens in this region, we can move 50 to 60 patients very quickly um, through pretty good capability. So we're excited to test that, whether it is on a tabletop versus uh, in person, uh, but do want to thank the county for that. Um, uh, we did honor 11 of our local Solano County stars uh, last month at the Sacramento for the California Ambulance Association Stars of Life. We had our uh, Solano County Paramedic of the Year, um, our EMTs of the Year, all the different cool. It was really awesome for them to get in front of their elected officials, in front of the people that make the laws and see the impacts that they have in their communities. Big shout out to uh, Senate Member Lori Wilson and Senator Bill Dodd um, for always being there to honor our, our stars, and they did a great job of making the field at home in Sacramento as good as you can, right? In Sacramento, you want to get in and get out. Um, but, again, thank you to them. And then lastly for us, I think this is here's the 50th celebration of EMS Week, and for us it's our 45th year in business. Um, you know, being a family, Solano-based, born uh, company and ambulance service, 45 years for us is really exciting. We'll be sending out invites. We're going to have a big party in June. Um, I'm a little behind on the, approving the invite list, so I apologize on that. I really should have had them uh, a couple months ago. Mom's probably uh, staring me down. But uh, June 15th in Vacaville, 
uh, we'll, we'll get those out really soon. But really excited to celebrate with our friends, with our community on 45 great years, and uh, we're really excited about that. So thank you so much, uh, Chair Jansen, and uh, we'll see you guys. Thank you. And, uh, any questions? Or yeah, uh, thank you for the report. So I, I think it was last last meeting you described that you guys have that, that Medicaid Amos has a contract now in Sonoma County, and I was just curious. I know it's not our county, but I know it's you know that that system is working well in, in contra costs. I'm just curious how it's going in Sonoma. I, I'm obviously biased. I think it's amazing. I think they picked a, a great subcontract. Well, us, really, what it is us in Sonoma County Fire District uh, partnered for the EOA, the exclusive operating area in Sonoma County. Very similar to Solano in size, makeup. Uh, we do about, we deploy about a peak of about 21 units uh, that are a mix of ALS and BLS. They have a consolidated dispatch, note, note, uh, that we might need to work on. Uh, that makes it just very seamless in terms of a tiered response. So we have ALS 91 units and BLS 91 units. Uh, but it's been, a, it's been a great partnership so far. I mean, we're 90 days in, so still on honeymoon. But uh, Sonoma County Fire is a great partner. Uh, we're operating, we're working with the county on, obviously, we have OCU like we do here, so a lot of the, they're, they're new there, but compliance looks great from, from our end, and like I said, still working it out, but uh, very excited, and um, great partners, great local partners, um, and I think that's one of the coolest parts, is that um, we're focused, as we are here, on our community, uh, we live locally, it's Sonoma's right there. It's a border county. Uh, it made sense for us. And again, also having the right partner with people focused on the community is a big deal. And I, and I know we have that here too. So uh, I think for us, with our partners in the Contra Costa, looking at how they're doing it, and really the economics of uh, what's allowable and reimbursables for California, right, in terms of uh, government funding for Medi Cal. And that's a significant. Um, what makes it uh, feasible makes sense. So uh, I think, uh, obviously, like I said, bias that it's, it's a fantastic system. But uh, I think it's really cool to see there's no, and I, don't, I know we don't have that here, and we haven't had that here for a long time, a fire versus private. I think we've had a great relationship and maintained that. That wasn't the case there. So it's been nice to see those barriers kind of break down, really that one team, one mission, one family working together, not against each other. Uh, it's been really cool to see. So, and we can actually just start focusing on patient care. But there's still politics too, so that don't don't get it twisted. But we're getting past it. So, yeah. So, any other questions? All right. Thank you guys. Perfect. Thanks, Jimmy. Okay. Item 6D, EMS quarterly activity report. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Adeline Ansari, Health Education Specialist with Solana EMS, and today I, along with my colleague Scott Wagner, will be presenting on EMS quarterly activity report for reporting period of October 1st through December 31st of the year 2023. Here is the general overview of today's presentation. We will start the presentation with our number of EMS applications followed by general EMS data. We will also cover our specialty care programs and we will end the presentation with new and ongoing projects. Looking at EMS numbers uh, of certifications, we had 60 EMT applications, which 21 were initials and 39 were renewals. We had 35 paramedics, which nine were initial and 26 were renewals. And we had y one MICNs, which stands for Mobile Intensive uh, Care Nurse, uh, that, and one, that, that one application was renewal. Next, we're looking at the general EMS data report, again for reporting period of October 1st through December 31st. Looking at our 911 call volume, the bar graph in purple shows the total 911 request. The bar graph in blue shows the patient contact we made. And the bar graph in green shows that out of the ones that we made a patient contact, how many patients were transported from the scene to the hospital. And as you can see, most of the patients that we made a patient contact with, we end up transporting them to the hospital. Next, we're looking at the city of incidents. So again, for reporting period of October through December, you can see that in a blue bar graph, we had number of 911 
uh, request that we end up transporting the patient from the scene either to our in-county receiving facilities and also including out-of-county receiving facilities. And looking at the blue bar graph, you can see Vallejo and Fairfield has the highest number, which makes sense because they have the highest population in our county. And just to have a fair comparison though, uh, between our seven big cities, uh, we are calculating something called incidence rate per 100,000 population. And when we did that, we see that Rio Vista has the highest number of requests when you consider their population. There are many reasons behind why Rio Vista could have you know, has such a high 911 request. One, it could be that they have the highest population size uh, for the age group of 65 and over. Another, it could be that the closest medical facility to Rio Vista is at least 30 minutes drive. Um, so as I said, there are many reasons behind it, but those two could be the, one of the two reasons that why Rio Vista has such a high 911 request. Uh, I know there was a question at the last meeting if these numbers include any 911 requests we receive from rural and remote area. So in the past, those numbers were included in, that, in those graphs, and how it was included, it was depending on where the incident happened in that rural or remote area, it was assigned to the closest, biggest city. Um, but this time around, we included that purple bar graph to show the individual, individual number of how many 911 requests we had specifically from rural or remote area in our county. And for this reporting period, we had 156 requests. Uh, also, going a little more in depth of how we are trying to categorize our numbers that we're receiving, or our 911 requests we're receiving from county side, from those small areas or towns in our county, I want to introduce you to this graph. This graph is, is, uh, this is our GIS graph that shows our urban, remote, and rural area in our county. And we are using a software called First Watch, and which monitors our 911 calls and number of transports. And that software uses this GIS map to um, kind of calculate or report how many calls we get from each city uh, or each area in our county. So depending on where the call is, that software includes the, that zip code and then assigns it to the closest near big city. And, and then for reporting for this purpose of this meeting, uh, when we are showing those big seven cities, includes all the unincorporated county site as well. And then this um, table shows the, some of the examples of uh, which areas in our county we are including under which big city. Um, so while we are working closely with our GIS team or department to provide the latest GIS map to our software first watch to be able to monitor accurately all the calls we get from remote and rural and, ur and urban side of our county. Next, we're looking at out of county transfers. I know this was another thing that was requested at the last meeting. Uh, we do uh, transport out directly from scene uh, from our county. And for this reporting period, we had 222 patients that were transported out of county directly from the scene. And these are the list of the locations that they were transported out to. Next, we're looking at uh, response priority, the graph to the left, and transport priority, the graph to the right. Uh, for response priority, we had 95% of the responses from dispatch to the scene was under code three, which means uh, light and sirens, and 5% of the responses was under code two, which was no light and sirens. And as for transport priority, we transported a patient from the scene to the hospital, 7% of the time under code three, and 93% of, of the time under code two. Next, we're looking at the level of treatment we provided to our patient while we were transporting them to the hospital. Uh, here you can see the trend analysis of, uh, of this graph for the year 2023 being divided by each quarter. On average, you can see we provided advanced life support treatment while we were providing, um, when we were transporting the patient, and which we called ALS. And around 35% of the times, we provided basic life support treatment, which stands for BLS. 
We are working closely with our transport agencies to make sure we are updating our protocols to make sure that we are providing the best care to our patient and also utilizing uh, our resources wisely. So we are closely monitoring our percentages for ALS and BLS. Next, we're looking at ambulance patient offload time, which also known as APOC. Uh, so here you can see the APOD for the expand of the one year divided by each quarter. And you can see the dotted line in red that shows the benchmark for our county, which is 20 minutes. And the dotted line in green shows the potential future county benchmark for APOD for California. As you can see, we're a little above that 20 minutes benchmark for our county, but we're definitely below that 30 minutes benchmark of California. Next, we're looking at specialty care programs. We have four specialty care programs in our county, which includes STEMI, stroke, EDAP, and trauma. And uh, these are the list of the designated hospitals for each program, and this list has not changed since last reported. Next, we're looking at the quality improvements. Every quarter, we are meeting with our, all of our providers, including pre-hospital, hospital providers, our fire departments, sheriffs, police, to present the general EMS data and also cover two specialty care programs data. And this will give us a chance to review and update any protocol and procedures needed. And this afternoon, actually, our team is presenting on trauma and EDOT. And just to give the overview of what we're gonna present at uh, this afternoon's meeting, the, the next several slides I will cover the trauma and EDA presentation. For Solana County trauma data, this is for reporting period of July through December 2023. In this graph in blue, you see the number of trauma visits we had. And then also in orange, you can see the, the number of trauma ad admissions that we have in our hospitals. But we have, it was worth to mention, we have two trauma centers in our county, Kaiser Vacaville being a level two trauma center and North Bay being a level three trauma center. Looking at demographics, you can see most of our trauma cases were male and they're the age group of 65 and over. Next, we're looking at out-of-county trauma numbers. So we do, our trauma centers receive uh, trauma patients from out-of-county as well. Either they come directly from the scene that happened out-of-county or they were in a hospital out-of-county and then they were transferred in. So 90 shows that we had 90 patients were transferred directly from the scene out-of-county to our hospitals in Solana County and 78 were EMS transferred in from out-of-county hospitals. Next, we're looking at the EMS trauma transport from scene to out-of-county. So we do also transport out directly from scene as well to out-of-county trauma centers as well. Depending on the location of the incidents and the severity of the patient, we do that. Uh, so for this reporting period, we had 33 patients that they were trauma patients that they were transported out of our county to the uh, closest facility of neighboring county, um, and this is a list of the centers that they went to. Next, we're looking at mechanism of injury, um, as usual, fall, along with motor vehicle uh, crush and a motor cycle crush, and pedestrians are the first four mechanisms of injury of trauma in our county. Next, we're looking at a trauma admits with ISS, score of 16 and higher. ISS stands for Injury Severity Score. So each trauma patient is assigned a severity score depending on how severe the trauma is. And the higher the number is, the severe the patient is. And usually the patient above 16 means that they are in a kind of a critical condition, and this is shows that out of those hospitals uh, visits for trauma we had, how many for each quarter they had the highest score, that had a score of 16 and higher. Next, we're looking at the post-ED disposition. So we are monitoring that what happened to those patients that, trauma patients that visited our ED hospitals. Uh, and uh, what happened to them after they got released from the emergency department. Most of them, they went to floor. 31% went home. 19% went to ICU. 
9% went to the OR, we had 3% that was transferred, and 1%, which is six, six cases, they were expired, and we had 2%, which is 15 cases, they were in another category, which mainly means either there was AMA or jail, or they went to the label and delivery. Next, we're looking at the trauma hospital dispatch, discharge disposition. So monitoring what happens to those trauma patients um, after they got released from our trauma centers. Uh, we had 80% of the patients went home, 10% uh, went to the uh, nursing facility. We had 2%, which is 11 cases expired, and we had 3% going to, the, to receive the high level of care, and we had 6%, which is 32 cases, went uh, under other category, which again, it is, is an AMA, or they went to jail, or they went to the psychiatric you know, facilities, or rehab. Next, we're looking at the trauma transfers. We had 156 into facility transfers, which 56 were due to the walk-ins, 78 from out of county, and 22 were due to the insurance coverage. Well, I want to emphasize that when we mention the insurance, insurance coverage, it means that uh, we stabilized the patient first. So the, the patient was stabilized first, and then they got transported to the hospital that the insurance covered. And then we had 17 transfers from our hospitals to go to the out of county to receive higher level of care. And here's a list of the um, facilities that we trans transferred out. Next, we're looking at the EDAP data for reporting period of July through December. Here you can see the breakdown of our four EDAP receiving centers we have in our hospital, which is Kaiser Vallejo, Kaiser Vacaville, North Bay, and Vaco Valley. It shows the PD, uh, pediatric ED volume for each hospital and how many were POV transport, which means private vehicle, how many were transported by EMS, how many intubations we had, how many expired cases we had, how many behavioral cases we had. We also monitor pediatrics volume by quarter per hospital as well. And this is just give us a chance to see train analysis if our pediatric volume is going up or down when you look at the one year expand. And then also we do have pre-hospital pediatric transports. Again, we do also transport out of county as well from the scene. Um, so the graph to the left shows that we had 36 cases of pediatrics that they were transported out from the scene to out of county. And then usually it depends of like where the location of the incidents is. Um, that plays a factor, also plays a factor of the request of the parents as well. Uh, we do transfer out due to that as well. But as you can see to the right, but most of our pediatric cases stayed in county and this is a list of the facilities in county that we transported those pediatrics patients. So this concludes my part of the presentation. At this point, I will have my colleague Scott to go over the new and ongoing projects. Hello, everybody. My name is Scott Wagness. I'm EMS coordinator with Solano County EMS <coughs> Agency. I want to go over some of our new um, and ongoing projects that we've been working on recently. Uh, how do we click at this? Uh, focusing on stop the bleed education, uh, emergency medical dispatch, ALS, BLS protocol updates, which we touched on earlier, and then our IGEL airway transition. For EMD, uh, we're, we launched in Fairfield at the beginning of this year just like we updated the last meeting. Um, currently operational with no major problems. Um, their system's working really well and getting feedback from field crews that dispatches are going really smoothly. Um, we're still working on some other uh, EMD sites uh, at our PSAPs in the county to try to get them integrated into that system and all on the same uh, communication platform. First, Stop the Bleed. Uh, this is a trauma presentation, so I figured I'd add this in. This is a, a project that we're currently working on with our county partners to develop an internal Stop the Bleed uh, training program. I'm a Stop the Bleed instructor since its inception back in 2017 or 2016, so I've been doing that a little bit uh, previously, so I'm gonna bring that to the county and some of my experience uh, teaching those classes. Uh, we're currently ordering training equipment, developing educational materials, and planning the classes for the rest of this year. Uh, these classes are going to educate Solana County staff, but also the public, um, how to stop life-threatening hemorrhaging. Uh, this is going to be an, an initial training class for the basic program, and then we can do some train-the-trainer classes and expand that network of trainers throughout the county um, and really boost that throughout. 
Uh, for our protocols, we talked about this a little bit, C3, M10, S13, those are all protocols that launched uh, earlier this year. Um, and we touched on the M10 sepsis is, I'm seeing it in PCRs being currently utilized and um, getting some treatments that the patients were receiving previously, but there may be a little more focused care on this specific uh, disease process. Upcoming protocol development is gonna be combining some more of the ALS and BLS protocols for respiratory, and then uh, IGEL related policies and protocols that may come up during our transition process to that airway device. 2024, we're gonna be transitioning over to the IGEL rescue airway device. This is just a backup rescue airway device uh, as a secondary means of controlling an airway to intubation. This is not gonna be replacing any other necessarily equipment that we currently utilize, but um, the goal is to phase out the king tube in, fa in favor of the IGEL um, because it has a little bit more uses and it's a widely accepted device throughout the state of California. Uh, really good news is that the IGEL is now California basic scope of practice for adult and pediatrics. So previously you had to put in a local optional scope of practice, a lot of training, a lot of uh, education stuff requirements to submit to the state. All that's pretty much gone now. Fortunately, we did do all the groundwork for all the training and, and education stuff and we submitted it to the state. They gave us their opinion on it. They said everything looks great. The protocol looks wonderful. Uh, we would approve this, but we no longer need to because it's no longer a necessary process. So in 2024, we plan to roll out the IGEL uh, for adult and pediatric patients. And for me, that's a big thing because we don't currently have an advanced airway for pediatric patients in Solano County, uh, just due to the equipment that we use and the processes that have been in place. But this device becoming widely available throughout California now allows us to have an advanced airway uh, option. It may not be always the right treatment for the patient, but it's an option that our providers can utilize. Um, that's pretty much the end of my presentation, but I did realize this is an EDAP presentation. Um, I'm on part of uh, EMS for Children Technical Advisory Committee for the state, and they asked me to speak at a conference next year, or next month, um, and the topic is reducing pediatric medication errors. So I'm gonna do a presentation. It's the first one for me in my career. I've been a paramedic in the field this whole time, so I'm, I'm stepping my game way up, but I'm gonna represent Solano County uh, in this presentation. I'm working with a doctor from Southern California to do this, and it's um, for CFED, which is uh, California Fire, EMS, and Disaster Management Conference. So it should be a pretty big deal. Um, I'm looking forward to it, and it's probably gonna be broadcast, so maybe you'll see a link for it. Uh, that concludes our presentation. If you have any questions, we're here for it. Thank you. I do have, oh, go ahead. Yeah, just go, going way back to the slide on the, what you call it, wall time, where the, the patient offload time, it obviously it seems like we're doing better than a, a lot of surrounding areas, but is, does, does the EMS agency have any power or control to improve that? Maybe that's a question for Ben, I don't, I don't know. Um, I believe that the state is dealing with that right now with um, trying to see who actually has the authority over the hospitals for that um, control. Um, we are fortunate that our numbers are lower than that. Um, but I don't have a, a, a for sure answer for you on that, but I believe it's still being figured out at the state. From a perspective standpoint, uh, I think it's important to remember that it's really not the EMS entity that's controlling the wall time, it's the hospital ER. And the, the thing that's out of our control is that um, healthcare professionals for the ER environment are scarce. Um, and so it, this is really reflecting more the difficulty in hiring um, in the ER environment so that they can have rapid um, turnover of the patient that comes in and, and has nothing to do with the quality of EMS. EMS is awesome. ERs are awesome, but they just need more help. They need more people. But by creating a situation where they need more people, now the ambulance providers need more people Correct. to cover. And I'm just, is, there, is there anywhere that has that in their like EOA contracts where it would affect that at all? Or could we We'll look into that. that. I don't, that's an excellent question, and, and I don't know the answer. But I don't think that the EOA contract um, binds the hospitals in any way because it's only between us and the ambulance company. So it wouldn't be the EOA con contract controlling the hospital environment. The question is who can, and Ben's right, it's only the state that has that kind of power. I mean, a local has no power over, over ERs. I had two questions on that is, <clears throat> with this time we're over our current standard, what's the impact? Are we even tracking the impact that a unit is tied up so it can't respond, so it creates a longer delay 
whatever that may be. And although our times are not too bad in comparison to a lot of uh, systems that are hours on end, what, what are they doing to impact this? It, it are, is there other ways that we can work um, with EMS and the ER to find a way to drop those times down? Because again, our, ours is at 20 minutes and, and other systems are extremely you know, longer than that. I think it's. I think th I would. I would start by reminding us that these are arbitrary times. There is no inherent right or wrong length of time. Um, the longer that the ambulance is there, the the longer it's not available to be in the field. Right. So, ideally, you could argue it would be five minutes. Get the patient off and move right back out. You'll find that there's a correlation between urban density and ER density and the times that ambulances are holding. It's in the rural areas um, where we have the longer hold times. We have fewer ambulances, we have fewer ERs, we have fewer personnel. So there is a correlation by density. And Solano is fortunate that we have a very good density of ER capacity and we have medic ambulance and, and Vacaville Fire providing the ambulance transports and they're both exceptional. And so the, the 21, 22, 23 minutes versus 20 minutes, it's really hard to make a judgment that that's having an, a meaningful impact. Although, Jimmy, if you wanted to respond to that, I would, I would appreciate your sense of it. <laughs> Not putting you on the spot or anything. Uh, I'm sorry, Jimmy. I did not invite you up. I know. Sorry, Chair. Okay. I'm, <laughs> sorry, I'm Chair. Exercise my authority here. Right. No, go ahead. No, I, I think uh, a couple things on this, and, and I just give my perspective from the state side. Uh, we that's not a dissected number, so I honestly think that we're under 20 minutes, right? Um, and I just I say that not from a status point. It's like our employees aren't perfect on going patient off. Right. So if we there's like I would just say there's probably a five minute wiggle room in there. And I think our hospitals are exceptional. Do we have some days that are like an hour? Yeah. But we're communicating and we get that in Sacramento we're at an hour and four minute average. Right. In the local ER. Um, so the impact for us as long as we're under 20 minutes is very minimal. Right. Even in Sonoma. We're having some days, but most of us are sitting right in that hot mid 20s. This is what the state would love to see. Right. Um, so I think there's just from a Solano County perspective to answer Josh's questions on the impact, it's very minimal, right? Uh, it, there are days where it's there and we have that, but I think the communication, they move and we know because all of a sudden there's nine units at North Bay, right? There's six units at Kaiser Vallejo or Sutter and all of a sudden we know that hospital is impacted. But um, I think from just a basic perspective, there's some work to do in the numbers to get that down. Like if we were... Like in SAC, because it's so scrutinized, right? They're honest. Like they even created like a, there's a, I think First Watch has something where you check in like right when it's in and right when you get out because they want to know. And even with that, UC Davis is still an hour and 10 minutes. So it's some areas it's, it's bad and then some areas it's, it's, it's not. So I think where you see this trend line up, that I would argue is raw. And if we edited that and looked into where we had mistakes and they had mistakes, that number would come down. So I think we're, I really believe, just from a field perspective, we're probably under 20. And I might add as well um, to what Jimmy was saying is that, like, from our perspective, we do provide our own kind of internal QI on this to take out the outliers because we've seen ambulance patient offload times of two seconds and 24 hours. And that's human error, you know, like it's like that's neither of those things are possible. So we try and, um, you know, this is a median, this is a median number. Um, you know, we try to like, then we contact medic and say, oh, what was the actual time? So we do it on that, their side. I totally agree that it's hard to know what the system impacts are when the, the variance is actually relatively low. I mean, really, it'd be in our system performance. Like, are we then not having enough ambulances to respond, you know, to the scene? But totally agree with um, what Bela said, is that this is a system issue that go, expands beyond EMS, beyond the emergency department, because everything is a flow. And if you ask the emergency departments, like, why is this time long, they'll say, because we have boarding you know, in the, I think our clinicians like know this because we have boarding in the emergency department at UC Davis, routinely we have 60 patients boarding in the emergency department. We can't use those beds, you know? And why are they boarding? Oh, there's no hospital beds. Why aren't there any hospital beds? Oh, well, there's no skilled nursing facilities to take the patients. Right. And so it's a, bad it's bad a part bad. of a huge system. And I, I totally agree, there's been a lot of attention being paid for this. And I think we'll see, certainly as, as we do always, whenever any financial implications come into this, especially from the hospital side, that the specific definitions and the scrutiny of 
when you click this button, wheels have stopped, I've arrived at the hospital, you know, there's cameras everywhere. How long did you take to get out of that ambulance, you know, and wheel the patient in? When would the transition of care actually occur, which we looked into it, is not well defined. Right. You know, like that exact transition of care, and then you say, do you, is it a signature, is it a button? So I think this is, it's a great point, but there's going to be, I think, a lot more emphasis on, on this specific number, specifically for the reason you said, is that in Solano, I think we do pretty well in our variances, you know, two minutes, it's like less than 10% across the board, but in other hospitals, so, uh, other counties, it's not like that. I do want to add one little thing, is yeah. because I, I want to defend our hospitals first, so yeah. they wanted to give that. But two, from a state perspective, they passed AB40. Now, EMSA doesn't have the funding for what they need to do to enforce AB40, so we're seeing that that's a wall time bill, and it's going to see of to measure and make sure the state, so there's, that's coming. But I do think, this is just Jimmy speaking now as an ambulance provider, I do think LEMSAs have a little more teeth than just saying it's on the state, right? Because we do do designations, we do have oversight of hospitals on certain things. I don't think our hospitals are at that level at all. So I wanna say that, but I do think, and we're saying this from a CAA perspective to MSAC and to EMSA, that the county has a little more, like in, even in Yolo County, when we deal with Sutter Davis sometimes, like there is some teeth that you have, whether it's through designating or whatever, to say, hey, this is a problem, you need to do something. Because I will use, we have some hospitals in SAC that still accept interfacility transfers, right? Like, so here's a Solano asset going to Sacramento on an interfacility high level transfer, and they're processing our ambulance through the ER. Right, so all of a sudden you have 20 ambulances waiting, and now they're treating our inner facility transfer as an inpatient, or sorry, should be treated as a bed because in Mtala, if I accept a transfer, I have to have a bed, but they're processing it through the normal ER intake, so they're waiting, and that's a problem, right? So I do think that while I do understand that the lenses are limited, there is some authority that I do think some in egregious areas, which we are not one right? But in, in those egregious areas that LEMSAs do have a role, and if we do see issues, I think the LEMSAs, LEMSAs do have stuff they can do. So wanted to add that two point. I got all caught up on protecting hope, our local hospitals. So. All right. Any comments? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think for future, I'd like to see kind of a breakdown of um, offload time by hospital. I think that would be much more useful than just the average. Perfect. And then I could do like the hospitals in our in county and do in county is out of one county as well most, most. Yeah. i mean i would just want to see in county in county perfect definitely and and just a comment on that because we're on this topic this is very complicated because the way this is tracked so for example if a patient go and you, we saw there's it's not a huge percentage but patients from solano go to uc davis that apot time is reflected in our numbers because that's the way the state tracks it. They started from the originating, you know, lump sum. Because otherwise, they, there's no way to like assign it to another county. So just uh, just that caveat that like if if their county is around us, and if we go, we go to John Muir a lot, John Muir's APOT time is in there. It's not solely our our facility, which which convolutes it a little bit. But maybe getting to your point. If we look at our specific hospitals, then it, it actually will make it more relevant, you know, for actions that, that we can change. And the other thing, I don't, I don't know, maybe because the actual um, actual bill, you know, AB40, is, is not a median, it's on 90th percentile. Yes. So less than 30 minutes, 90% of the time. So maybe that's something we could also report just to understand, like, our, this is more important number, but I think to understand, like, what potential compliance implications and regulatory implications that has in the future, we can also um, mention that as well. Yeah, Sorry. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I think that's something we can do. Yeah, for sure. All right, anything else? I just wanted to make one final comment, if I may. The, you know, from, from an outcome perspective, if you're tracking outcome, um, the fact that our response times are so incredibly high is a reflection on impact on capacity of the ambulances. So, you know, the city response times are extraordinary. Medic's response time is like ridiculously great. Um, and so if there were a meaningful impact, we would see reduced res response times and we're not. So, you know, the, the response percentages are a way of monitoring the overall impact of this on the system. And, and I would agree with Jamie that there is no discernible impact given how high our percentages are. 
that that's true from a patient outcome standpoint, but potentially not from a financial standpoint. I mean, if, if medic is having to hire more people and put on more ambulances to keep those times down, then it is impacting the system, not from a... It's part of the larger impact on healthcare. You're right. Healthcare is more expensive because we have redundant ambulances to accommodate this reality. Yeah, that's, that's very accurate. Also, I'd like to add, too, um, part of the programs why Solano County is so good on those numbers is the process that we're going to be reporting at our quarterly later, our alternate level of care unit. That is a BLS unit that is responding to a 911 call and seeing if it's going to be passed on to that BLS unit so that 911 vehicle is now available with that fire department to keep our times that way. On top of that, um, with the local optional scope of making paramedics have vent and five drips, that's helping the hospitals get those patients out in a timely manner than waiting for CCT, which could take hours. So there's, we're definitely thinking outside the box here in Solano County. I mean, there's definitely more data that we can, you know, dive in. Um, but I just wanted to note on that. On top, um, when Jimmy said that, you know, they have communication between the hospitals, they do. I'm, I'm saying if they go past the 20 minutes, they get a hold of a supervisor. The supervisor gets a hold of the ER nurse uh, supervisor. And if it gets to more than 45 minutes, somebody from my team gets notified. So, I mean, the collaboration is, is shown right there that you're not going to see in other counties. So I just wanted to know. All good? Okay. Well, thank you to staff for present, presenting. Good luck on your presentation. Yeah. Expect to see it on YouTube or something like that, right? Or just send us a link. We'll watch it. And, but uh, good luck. Yeah. With that, we'll move on to item number seven, items from the public. So this would be anybody that would like to address the board on our uh, regularly calendared items, which we only have one of. Is there anybody that would like to do that? Seeing none, we will move on to item eight, and it is the progress update on our exclusive operating area and request for proposal and timeline presentation. Yeah, Bill Bullard will be coming to do the presentation. Good morning, thanks for having me. Uh, can Welcome. I give 30 seconds on APOT? Or we killed that subject? No, go ahead, we'll take it. Just wanna make you feel a little better that we just finished an assessment report for a county in California, roughly the same size, and their numbers were 39 minutes. Taking that, using the difference between 39 and 20, so 19 minutes on average uh, extended, taking that times the unit hour cost, came out with a $4.8 million impact to the provider. So, and, and we will do the same type of analysis for you in the report that you will see here by your next meeting. So that, that's part of what we do. I think it's also very important, as you heard about response times, if you were to look at these patients that arrived with lights and siren on, this number would probably be less than 10, probably less than five. That's part of the challenge, as the clinicians here know. So it, it's a huge issue, um, but know that we'll give you a little more tangible numbers for what the cost is. We can also talk a little bit about some of the solutions that other places are using. We've done that with the California Health Healthcare Foundation about alternate strategies for what to do with patients. So, all right, with that, uh, we'll move on to, we've uh, provided an update in the uh, board packet you have. Very simply, we have completed quite a few interviews. Uh, as of next week, we'll have completed the interviews. We have uh, the ambulance, we have all the, the ambulance providers been talked with, the non-emergency uh, providers have been interviewed, the hospitals, the EMS agency, EMS medical director, et cetera. And on Monday and Tuesday next week, we will finish all the fire department interviews. We have uh, sit-alongs and interviews with the dispatch centers next week, as well as uh, a ride along with medic ambulance, something we do is we always get to the street, see it from that perspective. So we will go to your uh, hospitals, we'll watch the, uh, the offload uh, directly. Uh, the only thing that's still outstanding is whether or not the, uh, excuse me, the Solano County Fire Chiefs Association would like us to attend a meeting if they'd like that type of group discussion. So that, that offer's out there, and we'll, we'll see if they want to take advantage of that. We've gotten a decent amount of data. Uh, we're still, still being refined and sent to us, and we'll start to put this together, such as the APOT data we talked about. And if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, our timeline right now is next month we would have the draft uh, EMS assessment completed. 
and certainly by whether you prefer a separate meeting or in your meeting in 90 days, if you'd like a recap of that, we'll be able to provide that for you. Uh, ben, did I skip over anything? No, I think this is just a great opportunity for the, if the board has any questions in the process or any questions, you know, past and future right, with this yeah, RFP process. I don't have any questions, but if that was an offer, we will accept that on behalf of the Fire Chiefs Association. Okay, perfect. Perfect. And are, uh, are you the go-between? Go, go yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We'll make that happen. Anyone else? I do have a question. Is Please. it normal to not interview the board or to interview the board in this process? And, and my point being that um, you're talking to a lot of the stakeholders except the consumers, and that's my Jo job is to look out for the consumers as well and it looks like that p piece is missing in the stakeholders and I know you probably wouldn't want to talk to the taxpayers association as a whole or yeah. anything like that but yeah um, that's a great yeah, question that, that's my my question to you and I, I raised it to Ben yeah go ahead I'm sorry uh, yeah I think we'd be looking at some potential conflict of interest is issues so we'd want to look at that further before that happens I didn't okay. know that that was an issue that was going to be raised so but we can look into that okay yeah, I'd appreciate it just to see if we have the ability to do it without any conflict. I don't want to put a, any uh, glitches in the, uh, s the process at all, but it would be um, interesting. So have you done it before? May I ask that? A absolutely. So uh, our f we're wide open. We will interview. Uh, we will talk with anyone and everyone that's interested in talking with us. Uh, normally, the public is not educated enough on what they're receiving. They just know if they dial 911, they're going to get something in a few minutes. And so uh, we have done a couple town halls, have not usually received a lot of interest. Usually the stakeholders show up at the public town hall meetings to make sure that the, their uh, opinions are being heard as stakeholders. But that said, happy to, to meet with anyone. Okay, great. Thank you. So if, uh, if you can let me know whenever, that would be great. All right. Appreciate it. Um, anything else? All right. Well, Bill, thank you very much. All right. Thanks for the time. Okay. And we move on down to uh, board member comments. And we'll start with uh, anybody have comments from the board? Anything? Okay, hearing none, but of course I do. Um, we made mention earlier of the proposal that uh, Sonoma County is doing now with Medic and what uh, um, Contra Costa is doing. I know that was a potential here in this county as well. Is there a chance for an update on where we are with that, with uh, that process? Because it's been kind of quiet. I don't really know where we are or anything with that. It's not good when the attorney has yeah, to yeah. lean well, in I mean, on two I, of my questions. I, I think this will be the last time you see me holding this position. <laughs> it's so much easier when it's Bill. Um, so, so, I mean, the answer to your question is it's not our process, so we don't, we don't really have any insight. I mean, this, is, this isn't something that the county or the agency is involved with. So it, it's a good question, but I don't believe we have an answer as to where we are on that, do we? Or has it been proposed from the fire department formally, or? I don't think we have information to share on that, no. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. Let's see if I can get one more in there. All right. Hey, um, we, we sit here and, and look at a lot of statistics and we get a lot of information and, and great for that. But we, I have a tendency of forgetting what this is all about. So um, we had one of our high schools, one of our teachers teach in there. She dropped, went into cardiac arrest. Uh, really great teacher, nice lady. What happened? Boom, just exactly what was supposed to happen. Uh, principal got down there, started CPR, put the AED, defibrillated a couple times. She's alive and well, getting ready to come back to work in about a, a month. And so just wanted to take, that happens all the time in this county, right? With all the players. So although we sit here and look at this data, 
let's remember back to what we're really doing here, and, and that's what I'm really appreciative of. So I just wanted to end it on that. Okay. With that, we're adjourned. Next meeting, July 11th, right here. See you then.